having a baby is life-changing. Tonight, I'd like to share with you a personal story of how becoming a dad turned me into an entrepreneur, of how my wife's first pregnancy and this little guy inspired us to take a leap into the unknown, to quit our jobs, to move 10,000 kilometers away from friends and family, end up in Silicon Valley, and take up the challenge to build the future of maternal health. It all started in February 2013. Um, back then, I was um, active in digital technologies. I was uh, heading a group of engineers and scientists uh, developing some of the most advanced wearable sensors for application in health and wellness. My wife was a ligand counsel at a con construction company, and back then she was 37 weeks pregnant. One night she comes back from work, and she starts having contraction. So we were not exactly sure what to do. We've been told that contractions were totally normal, but uh, in the case they would become more regular, they could be indicative of labor. So we waited for a couple of hours, and then after two hours, the contractions were becoming more regular. So we got very excited. We're like, all right, this is probably the night. This is the night where we'll become a mom and a dad. So we took the suitcase that we had packed the week before, hopped in the car, and drove to the hospital. Uh, we arrived in the hospital, my wife carrying her pregnant belly. I was following with the suitcase. We got at the registration desk, and the nurse very quickly uh, put us into a monitoring room where she started equipping my wife with an interesting instrument. She put two belts and two probes on her belly that she connected to a big machine, and from that machine, we had a piece of paper coming out. On that piece of paper, there was a red trace, and the nurse explained us that this red trace is my wife's contraction activity. We're like, okay, fair enough. So we started looking at that red trace coming out of the machine. Five minutes, 10 minutes, half hour, and the contraction's starting to disappear. Then we got pretty panicked, like, what's going on here? So is the baby okay? Or is that normal that contractions are gone? So we called the nurse, and the nurse came in, and the first thing she did is reassure us, say, yeah, no problem, the baby is fine, but clearly the contractions are gone, so you're not in labor, it's not going to be for tonight. What a disappointment. So we had not much to do, just take our suitcase back, hop in the car, and start driving back home. On the way home, we felt disappointed, frustrated, and a bit embarrassed by this overall situation, having to travel to the hospital for pretty much nothing. So let me ask you that. How many moms and dads do we have in the audience? My mom, papa, moms, dads, raise your hands. All right. So how many of you have experienced something similar? How many of you have gone to the hospital for some reason or another? Oh, pretty much the same amount. That's interesting. So try to, try to remember, like back then, how did you feel? We first felt frustration and embarrassment. But then something that struck me was how old this technology was. So think about it for a moment. Technology has disrupted every single industry we know. It has disrupted consumer electronics, for example, TV. It has disrupted how we access information with the internet. It has disrupted how we communicate with the smartphone. Yet, moms and doctors are left with the same technology that was initially introduced in 1971. That is 45 years ago. How amazing. So a few nights after uh, this happened to us, I was uh, talking with my friend and colleague and soon-to-be co-founder, Eric, and I was telling him the same story I just shared with you tonight. And he was like, dude, you know that the technologies we're working on, we could totally apply that to this problem. We could take some of those sensors and use them to measure the health of moms and babies. I was like, yeah, I think you may be right. And so, so that night, really, is the night where the idea behind Bloom Life came to life. So then we started diving into the topic a bit more. We wanted to make sure that this uh, frustration and this experience that my wife and I had just had wasn't an isolated case. We wanted to make sure that other people experienced similar. Well, obviously, you did, but back then we were not too sure. So uh, we started talking to expecting parents. We talked to uh, other parents. We talked to doctors and nurses. Um, and what we found out is that, clearly, we were not the only one. But something that really struck us there is that, for my wife and I, it was inconvenience, it was embarrassment. But for way too many people, many people that goes beyond this. 
For some people, pregnancy is associated to adverse events, with sometimes terrible complications for either the mom or the baby. One in five pregnancies are associated with some type of complications. The most common of it is preterm birth, or the birth before 37 weeks of gestation. Preterm birth affects 15 million of babies throughout the world every year, out of which one million will die from the consequence of preterm birth. So this is a big problem. These are big numbers. Yet, nothing is known about preterm birth, or very little. Doctors and people don't understand why we have preterm birth. They don't understand how it develops. And we have very little treatments and therapies to actually impact on preterm birth. So let me give you a quick example to illustrate this fact. The March of Dimes is an organization in the US which is advocating for reducing the, uh, the rate of preterm birth and putting a lot of efforts in that. They've set out seven criteria that uh, allows you to decide whether a mom is at risk for preterm birth or not. So the first criteria is whether she had a history of preterm birth before. The second is that she has a, a multiple pregnancy, like twins typically tend to come earlier. The third one is that she's smoking or taking drugs. Never a good idea if you're pregnant. Don't do that. The fourth one is your age. If you're under 17 or, below, or above uh, 35, you are more at risk of preterm birth. The fourth one is her weight. It's going to be some health condi conditions that she may have. And lastly, her personal history, her race, where she comes from, whether there is a history of preterm birth in her family. Seven criteria. What really struck me here is that there is no information about how the mom's health evolved during pregnancy. There is no information about the pregnancy itself. There is no information about the baby. This points to the fundamental problem that we see in maternal health. And that problem is the lack of evidences, the lack of data. It's not the first time that, uh, that we see such problem in, uh, in the history of medicine. And so let's go back a little bit, a couple of decades back, actually 1945. April 13, 1945. Theodore Roosevelt was then president of the United States and suddenly died from a stroke. That was totally unexpected. At that time, Nobody really knew why we had strokes. People didn't know how they developed, and there was no real treatment available. This was the trigger for the United States State Department of Health to start what would become one of the largest studies in the history of medicine. It took three years to set up that study. And in 1948, the city of Framingham in Massachusetts was uh, selected as home for that study. 5,000 people men and women, will be recruited. They will be asked to have one medical checkup every two years and to have their medical data stored for their entire lifetime. But not only for them, also for the children and the grandchildren. Today, 70 years later, that study is still running. And it has been the source of most of the knowledge that we know today on heart diseases. The link between hypertension and heart diseases, the link between smoking and heart diseases, all the facts and risk factors we know today come from that study. Now let's pause for a second. Can you try to imagine what such a study would be in today's world? Like back then, scientists and doctors, they just had pen, papers, they had very rudimentary equipment to track vital signs. Today, we have the cell phone, we have the internet, we have what's called digital health, or the convergence of digital technologies into healthcare. You've probably all heard of digital health in one way or another. Perhaps you own an activity tracker, so a Fitbit, and then you use it to track your step, to track your activity, and perhaps you share that information with your friends. Or perhaps you like to uh, uh, track your pulse rate when you exercise. Or perhaps you've been taking care of parents or grandparents who have been prescribed such telemonitoring equipment to track the vitals from their home. I worked over 10 years in the digital health technologies. And today, as a dad and as an entrepreneur, I made my goal to bring digital health technologies to moms and their doctors so that this 
becomes a thing of the past. No more expensive, bulky equipment. No more paper in the digital era. The future is a small, comfortable, discreet, but yet accurate solution to track the health of mom and baby along pregnancy. 24-7, anytime, anywhere. Soon, such a patch will give us a 360-degree view on the health of mom and baby. Starting early in pregnancy, we can track information about the, the health of the mom, her activity, her stress level, how much she sleeps, how much calories she burns, what's her heart rate, even her fitness level. As the pregnancy progresses, we can start tracking information about the baby. How much does the baby move? The baby heart rate. And as the body is getting ready for labor, and we can then start tracking information about uterine activity and contractions. All these data available digitally. We make this data available to doctors and to moms. Doctors can then share that information with their partner. They can share it with their friends if they want to. They can share it with their birth classes. Through a secure connection, they can also share that data with their doctor, providing valuable insights in between prenatal visits. Now imagine that this mom is not the only one using the system. Imagine that her friends are also using the system, and the friends of her friends are using the system, and the communities of moms are using the system. And imagine that this data coming from thousands of moms, can then be de-identified and aggregated to create the largest data set on maternal health ever collected. This is the future of the Framingham study. Combining digital health technologies with the power of crowdsourcing data. And in the same way that the Framingham study is still today, 70 years later, the source of most of the knowledge we have on heart diseases, this data about health of moms and babies will provide us the foundational knowledge that we need to understand pregnancy complications and improve birth outcomes. This is game-changing. For the first time ever, doctors will have access to medical-grade data along pregnancy. At a population level, this will allow us to redefine what we mean by normal pregnancy or at-risk pregnancy, based on data, based on evidences. And in the same way that we can uh, today track the evolution of our baby using charts and percentiles, we can think of tracking the evolution of pregnancy using similar charts. For example, we could track the evolution of baby kicks over pregnancy and see what's normal and what's not normal. We could start tracking the evolution of contractions over pregnancy and start having a contraction charts. At the individual level, the doctor now has access to specific data about a mom and a baby, and he can provide more personalized treatment because every pregnancy is unique. For the first time ever, moms can get access to that information at their fingertips. No need to travel to the hospital or to the doctors, no need to rush if she feels something that she is not sure about. She can first check from the comfort of her phone, get a second opinion, get reassurance, and only if it's needed, then go to the hospital and to the doctors. For the last three years, our team at Bloom Life has been working hard to making this vision for the future of maternal health a reality. The first step we're taking is to bring contractions to moms and dads, to take the guesswork out of, the, of our content contractions. And to wrap up the talk today, I want to share with you the stories of two of our early users. The first one is my wife, again. As an entrepreneur or as a technologist, I always like to test the technology that I'm developing. Unfortunately, in that case, that was pretty difficult. So my wife kindly volunteered and agreed to try the technology early on. So when she was pregnant with her second kid, there was really no need for her to rush to the hospital when she felt contractions. She could just put a sensor on, here with the help of her first, uh, so that she can start tracking contractions. She can get information on her phone, and only when we have confirmation on the phone that contractions become more regular, then go to the hospital. Then we get to the hospital, 
happy, as you can tell. <laughs> and then there we can see validation that what we get in the app is indeed what's in the bigger machine, confirming that indeed she's experiencing what she, she thought she's experiencing. So what a difference compared to her first pregnancy. No rush, no worries, no frustration. Just the joy and the happiness of having a little baby. The second story I want to share with you is, again, within family. That's the story of my sister. So that was actually last year. Um, it was April 2016. Um, my sister then announced me that um, she's uh, pregnant. She's pregnant with uh, twins. So of course, my first reaction is, well, congratulations. I congratulate her. But very quickly afterwards, like, hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> do you want to try the system? <laughs> So she said yes. I mean, it was very kind of her. Uh, but it, it turns out to provide very, very valuable insights for her. And so a few months later, um, it was in, uh, in September. It was September the 7th, actually. I remember that, night very, that day very well. It was nighttime in, uh, in Belgium. And I was then in San Diego, actually San Diego airport, about to pass a security. And I got a phone call from my sister. We don't call each other that often, so if she calls me, it's probably important. So <laughs> I'll pick it up. And she, say, she's, she was uh, 28 weeks pregnant back then. So um, I pick it up and she, and she said, hey, Julien, how's it going? I'm using your system. I was like, oh, great. And she asked me, like, are you sure it's accurate? Uh, I was like, well, thank you for the trust here. But <laughs> yes, I'm pretty sure it's accurate. You know, we've validated and developed it for two years. It matches what we see in the hospital. So yes, I said, why are you asking? She was like, well, you know, I'm 28 weeks pregnant, and the system is telling me I've been having a lot of contractions, which uh, I don't necessarily feel. I was like, you know, you're pretty early indeed, so I think you should go and check out with your doctor. So the day before, in the morning, that's what she did. She walked to the hospital and, and met with her doctor. And at that time, her doctor decided to admit her at the hospital. He indeed diagnosed her with preterm labor, and because she was so early, uh, he preferred to actually keep her in the hospital, keep her in the hospital bed rested, with continuous flux of tocolytic. So tocolytic is that drug that suppresses contraction so that her kids will have enough time to finish development and be ready to, to get out. She stayed in the hospital for four weeks. And then on October the 6th, she delivered two beautiful babies, Valentin and Gabriel. They're perfectly healthy today, and we're all very happy about it. But sometimes we wonder what would have happened if she didn't pick up on her preterm labor. I wish that every mom and dad will have access to such a technology, if they want to. Last year, we made Bloom Life available to selected users in the US, and have helped deliver dozens of healthy babies. We're now making Bloom Life available throughout the US for every mom over there, and we'll be working hard in the next months and years to make that technology available in Europe and throughout the world, and deliver on a mission to design the future of maternal health. This is game changing. We are at the beginning of a paradigm shift in maternal health. It is enabled by digital health. It is accelerated by crowdsourcing data on the health of moms and babies. This data has the power to revolutionize maternal health. But this revolution this revolution is ours to make. It is yours to make here. We all know someone who's pregnant. Perhaps you're expecting, or perhaps you have a friend who's expecting, or a sister, or a daughter. I hope that at the end of the event tonight, you'll share with her this vision of building the future of maternal health together. You'll engage her into sharing her data for the sake of her baby, but for the benefits of thousands of moms and babies throughout the world. And tonight, together, let's take the challenge that one day, every baby will have a healthy start in life. Thank you.